Welcome everyone to our final webinar of the Unlocking Agility series. I'll now hand over to Declan Curry, our host for today. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Savado Briefing on Unlocking Agility in association with our partner for the series, Asana. I'm Declan Curry. I'm a journalist and broadcaster. I've been reporting on business and the economy for very nearly 30 years now, and I chair discussions among businesses around the world. I'm delighted to be your moderator today, and I hope you will be a big part of our discussion. I'll tell you how in just a moment. This is the third and final webinar of our series on unlocking agility. In earlier editions, we talked about the difference between agile and agility, and about the importance of cross-functional collaboration. If you miss those, you can catch up with them on the Avado website. Today, we're going to look at simple steps and simple tech to make your team more efficient. We will look at the importance of being agile as opposed to just doing agile, and we'll consider the central role of a test, learn, and iterate approach. Our excellent contributors will share their thoughts and experience. Allow me to introduce them to you. They are Tanya Bachi, who is the Group People Development Director at Legal and General. She specializes in developing people and organizations to achieve what they thought was never possible. Also, Mike Fenner, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Avado. He's worked with the biggest names in the technology business, including Microsoft, Fujitsu, and IBM. And Francesc Artigas Rost, head of EMEA Solutions at Asana. He's a consultant, he's passionate about better collaboration and a more connected world. Alongside the three of them, we want to hear from you. Anytime you like, ask your question, share your observations in the chat function on your screen. You can ask your questions anytime that suits you, and we'll consider some answers for them towards the end of our time together. So let's get straight on to the discussion. Many organizations want to be agile. Using technology is an important part of that, but waiting for a big tech rollout across the entire business can take time. So can you effectively start small and scale fast? Tanya Bachi, let's have your opening thoughts on this, on how effective it is to start small and scale fast. Thanks, Declan. Um, I guess for me, you, you mentioned being versus, versus doing Agile. And I guess for, for me, it's about um, the being part of Agile is really is really relevant to all parts of an organisation, whether you're you know, in marketing or uh, in product development or HR, etc. I think it's really relevant to everyone. So I think that's the first step is to believe that it's not just about tech teams that can be agile, actually anyone has the ability to be thinking more agilely about their work. I think also there's something about um, being mindful about where people are on their journey and the maturity of the organisation. So for me, for example, I, I tried to kick off some agile ways of working within my learning team and it sort of fell apart really. We tried to do some uh, daily stand-ups, we tried to set up some scrum teams around line management capability development or leadership development. And actually what we found was the rhythm of the work didn't work so well with that type of a approach. And we probably also didn't do a great job of thinking about what the work was and then translating it into the methodology. So I think the, way, the, the better way to start is to be thinking about the mindset that you need for agile ways of working and really not, not um, blindly applying a methodology that may or may not be right for not just the work, but actually where you are in your maturity journey and getting people to think about well, what are the problems that we're really trying to solve here? What are the business outcomes that we want to get to? And by anchoring to that, you can then think more broadly about, actually, it's, it's very relevant to design thinking, it's very relevant to innovation thinking, um, and, and the processes are, are, are very similar, actually, but I think we sometimes get bogged down in the, the technical terms and of the methodology itself that blocks us from actually being agile in the way we're, we're thinking and, and applying our skills. It sounds almost like you need to take a step back and think, well, what is it that we want to do? What is it we're trying to achieve? And how do we as a team work together? How do we play to our strengths? Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. I mean, I think, again, if you think about Agile as a, a way of working about doing and iterating and, and kind of a waterfall process in terms of documenting and reporting, 
as you're moving into a more agile way of working, actually probably a bit of a hybrid model is, is worth adopting, um, in, especially when you're thinking about um, large organizational wide, wide implementations like a, a new ARP system or a big functional transformation within HR or, or finance or whatever. I think in order to keep stakeholders um, brought on the journey, you do need to have those waterfall type documentations, that reporting, but equally, you don't want to hardwire yourselves into potentially, um, you know, a very costly um, configuration of a system, for example, that actually then is, is requires you to unpick it because you've gone too far down one route without doing a bit of that testing and learning as you go. Um, you know, Agile is all about doing, doing stuff in small increments and making sure that you're heading in the right direction without going too far down one route without test, without um they're really testing and, and, and assessing whether it's it's the right path to take. So, like I say, I think it's very much about also ad adapting your ways of working as you go and making sure you're you're taking people along the journey with you. Thank you. And we'll develop uh, some of those thoughts uh, during the course of our conversation when we come to consider some uh, practical uh, examples of what's been done and what lessons have been learned from that. Uh, but uh, Mike Fetter, just uh, to bring you in with, with broad uh, opening uh, considerations. We've talked about uh, starting small and scaling fast. A key factor here is building momentum. How is that achieved? Thanks for the question, Declan. It's great to be here with Tanya and Francesca as well. I'm very excited to join the conversation. Um, I, I want to second all of Tanya's points, actually. And the, the key message I suppose I want to start with is don't accidentally end up um, over engineering and spending a long time planning how you're going to go about getting agile into your company or your team. So th there's a very real danger that you end up over engineering something to Tanya's point. Um, at, one of the key principles of agile is about continuous improvement. So even if you just start with something as basic as saying, well, every week, how is my team going to get together and reflect on what we've done this week? And what one thing could we change next week? Or one thing could we make sure we keep doing to make sure that we uh, are improving as a team that is um, at its heart what agile is about and making sure that you're continuing to improve so that doesn't require any technology um, it even doesn't require a load of stakeholder buy-in it, it requires some buy-in from your team to a process of continual improvement and it enables uh the, the long-term process that you need in place to continually improve and, and to get to a more agile working practice uh, over, a, over a, a sustainable future. So um, but that's my sort of number one message to open with really is about don't, don't spend a long time thinking about this. Start very, very, very small and think about how you could just make the first step in the right direction as a team. Thank you. Of course, it's not an entirely uh, technology-free process, and we'll talk about uh, where technology can be used most effectively in our discussion as well. Uh, but uh, Francesca Artigas, uh, we've talked now about starting small, about how we build momentum. It's also important that we learn quickly, and that requires clarity and empowerment. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Declan, and, and happy to be here as well, um, and, and contribute to this panel. I think to to I, I need to concur to everything that they've said, um, both Mike and, and Tanya. It's it's less about the process and more about the the how can I improve this? It doesn't matter what process you're following, and and just getting into that mindset is what's making you more agile. So things about um, as as Mike was saying sit together and decide how are you going to run your meetings? How are you setting your agenda? Um, what, um, is, what needs to happen? What are the actions to be taken after that meeting? And that is already giving clarity in the simple step that you can have with your team, right? How you run your team meetings, how you're gonna run the actions that are coming after that. Um, a great example, and I'm going now to the technology piece, but I think internally in Asana, we've done this, we use Asana, we use our own product, obviously, but we set agendas beforehand. We track actions there. We even have uh, an integration with, with Zoom, the technology that we're using now for this webinar, and we get transcriptions and recordings in there for anything that anyone that wasn't attending. So that gives already uh, a good speed and makes the, the process of catching up and, and getting up to speed for whoever wasn't there much smoother. 
Thank you. Uh, and Mike, just to hammer home the point before we uh, move on, the lesson from this part of the discussion so far is that thinking big and starting small is the most effective way to create momentum and to learn quickly. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, as, a, as an example from Avado, um, just to introduce the concept of, we've already talked about um, agile in non-technical teams. Well, um, the couple of examples I'll probably use during this discussion uh, to illustrate this are our compliance team, so our information security and compliance team, and also our executive team. Um, so as an example, with our executive team, where we actually moved to an agile model last year um, and with, with some great success, uh, that then we taking the concept the concept of continuous improvement as an example a few weeks ago we had a retrospective meeting where we looked back at the week we just had to figure out how we could improve one of the things we started to talk about in that conversation was do we need to have daily stand-ups every day which is what we've been doing for some time or is there value in maybe giving some time back and maybe having three a week and the conversation started to go go take take gather pace and um i sort of said well why don't we just try it? That's that's the key point here. Let's not spend an hour discussing whether we should permanently change our stand-up routine. Let's do next week with three stand-ups. And then next Friday, we'll look at it together and see how that improved or whether it made things worse. So um, again, that's an example of starting small and then iterating from that point. Uh, uh, Tanya, this, um, uh, sorry, just to say, we welcome your questions. Uh, those of you who've been uh, good enough to join us and are uh, enjoying this discussion we want you to be part of it as well any questions you have feel free to ask them now using the chat function on the screen uh, Tanya when we consider this uh, test learn iterate uh, approach uh, as Mike suggested there there may be parts of the organization where it is less appropriate uh, than others what are the examples that we could draw on that you could draw on from your career of where it's worked where it hasn't worked, where it needed a bit of a tweak to become more effective? Sure. I mean, I think it always needs tweaking. I think that's, a, a, or I've never seen it be landed in one way and it hasn't needed some iterate. I mean, that's the, the, the whole point of being agile, isn't it? You know, we kind of need to test and iterate as we go with everything that we're doing. I think, I mean, one part in uh, legal in general where it's working extremely well is our direct customer team. So, they doubled their profit in a year and turned that part of the business around by implementing Agile as a way of working across their, across their teams. Um, for example, they're using data science and automation to predict customer behaviour um, through an Agile way of operating. And I think that there were many learns from that in the sense of, um, you know, they started small about 18 months ago with a couple of teams they uh, what they did definitely find was in, in certain teams where they were running sprints, uh, lots of people were complaining that BAU meant that they couldn't really run this sprint. So they were coming against quite a lot of, um, I guess, in some ways, opposition from other parts of the organisation. And what they found was very much it was an education process, both for their own teams and trying trying out the methodology. Um, they had a, um, an external scrum master work with them to make sure that they were adapting the methodology in a way that was appropriate for them. I definitely would uh, recommend where you're actually trying to do the process in the way they were doing it. You should definitely be thinking about getting some external support in you know, people who are really ex real experts in that. And that helped them, like I say, adapt it to, the, to their rhythm and their ways of working. Um, you know, for example, things like they ended up putting in a, um, a pre-sprint planning session to make sure everyone who was involved in the sprint from whatever part of the business was really clear on the commitment and the timelines uh, so that they, they really lent into that work in the way that it needed to so they could hit the, hit the outcomes they, they needed in that particular, in those sprints. Um, I think another learn from it as well was actually that I think training people before they're going to use a process doesn't work because you end up with people who are trained up to do something and they very quickly forget it because they're not using it in their day jobs um, and or it kind of excites them into doing something that they're not they're not able to use in their in their working lives so I think it, it can have a bit of a, a, a double negative really. Um, so we'll, I think we'll talk a little we'll talk a little bit more about that in more detail uh, in, in the next segment of the uh, discussion. But uh, you're, I'm, I'm struck by uh, a word you use there because it echoes something that Frances said uh, in his earlier answer was the importance of clarity. People 
knowing what, what was expected of them, but also a, a sense on the part of people that there was a purpose to it. There was a relevance to it in the role that they do. Absolutely. I, I think making that clear connection with purpose, I guess, at its highest level is, is really important. So people are aware of the outcome that they're trying to achieve and they collectively feel responsible for that outcome. Um, otherwise, it just feels like an additional thing that you've got to do and then that doesn't make sense. But I think, uh, you know, being able to iterate with Agile is really important. Now, I mentioned my team earlier, my learning team earlier and how we tried some of those um some of those daily standards, etc. Part of that, I think, is we were just we weren't ready for it. We hadn't thought about the work and and, and, and adapting our work to a sprint methodology type of process. Uh, so it's not that I don't think it could work in 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 many many parts of an organisation, but I think it does take some thought, some um, some uh, preparation. Uh, but actually, there's very few parts of an organisation where I don't think at least the um, the mindset is definitely uh, definitely important to everyone. I think the process is more about how mature you are on your journey in in in, in agile. And Francesca, I can see you nodding in agreement during uh, much of what uh, Tanya was saying. Uh, the important point from all of it was that. Uh, it has to feel relevant. It, there has to be a sense that it's adding value. It's not, as Tanya just said, it's not just doing yet another thing, that there's a purpose yeah. and a, a reason to it. From your experience of practically what works and what doesn't, how do you give people that sense that it is adding value? Well, I, I think um, one important piece, which is related to the clarity that we were talking about before, is how we're connecting the, the daily work that is happening or that anyone is responsible for to the, to the greater objectives of the company, if you want, or the mission of the company. How all those things are interconnected is what it's regaining or, or making the, the employees to be engaged with the company. And by having employees that are engaged, obviously they're going to work towards the same objectives, work faster with more eagerness, and, and, and the company will become more agile. It's all about the individuals as well. It's not Transform, transforming the company. You first need to transform the individual to transform the company. Um, and just to, to maybe uh, uh, comment on, on what Tani was saying, I do agree that in the culture and mindset, any type of uh, organization, team, function can be or adopting that approach of just learn and iterate. Um, in fact, I, I feel fortunate because the companies that I've worked for, the tech companies, they embrace that culture, they embrace that mindset. We used to have, for instance, at Dropbox, what we call Hack Week, which was a, a, a time where everyone was getting together with that mindset of hacking, hacking anything related to the company, the product, the culture, the employee experience, the community around us. And that, as you were saying, Declan, is also about the empowerment. You're empowering you, the, the employees to think by themselves how we can improve. And um, as, as, as silly it can, it, it, can, it can sound, we were stopping the company, the business for one week, and that make us more agile by the creativity of our employees. A lot of features that were then launched afterwards in Dropbox were coming from ideas in that one week. Um, in Asana, for instance, we have the kickoff uh, week where everyone is empowered and is encouraged to sit together with their teams, reflect to the last six months, what has happened, what worked well, what didn't work well, and change things, improve and plan ahead. And, and that's already a test, test, learn and iterate, maybe very expand in six months, but certainly something that you can start implementing and, and, and it's changing the mindset of the company. Thank you. Uh, and Mike, these are, you know, these are great ideas and you can see them working very well in uh, technology focused businesses. Uh, stopping the business for a week, perhaps not so practical if you're running a nuclear power station or something like that. How do you uh, take the best that the technology industry has learned on how you make uh, test, learn, iterate work and apply it to, shall we say, more traditional industries? <laughs> It's a very good question, Declan. And, I, and on the point of, um, I, I agree with what Tanya and Francesca about tying things back to the why. In terms of, yeah, there are some industries, by the way, where you can imagine some functions or things that you actually wouldn't want to touch agile with a barge pole. In terms of its, um, 
in terms of its uh, process and uh, uh, trying something out with real users and real learners or real customers or whatever it is. So air traffic control systems, you probably don't want to put a minimum viable product out for, for use at an airport um, in the way that you might try and do that with um, something that has a much lower impact. So there's definitely an industry specific thing you need to think about. But I'd say those are the exceptions rather than the rule. Um, in terms of I'll try and illustrate the question that my point related to the question you're asking by talking a bit, little bit about our compliance team. So this is a team that you, uh, or at least a stereotypic, stereotypically, you wouldn't consider that that is the first place you'd go with an agile process. Um, and thinking back again onto the, the, the why you go about making a change like this. Yes, I totally agree that if you can tie it back to why we come to work, why our, what our company purpose is, this is great. But actually, even at a much more micro level, there's there are really good reasons that your team can buy into. So as an example, our compliance team was hit with quite a number of issues that other teams might recognize. So they would start work on whatever they think the highest priority thing is. And then the next day, a senior stakeholder asks and says, where's this other thing? Um, this is really important. So you have to change your focus and move, move on to something else. And the next day, somebody else comes around the office and says, well, there's this other thing I need. It's desperately important and urgent. So these are some of the problems that a lot of teams would recognize. And that's one of the reasons we actually implemented an agile process with our compliance team where you know, one of the aspects of Agile is about making more transparent the work that you do and getting it prioritized in a much more ordered, structured fashion by all the relevant stakeholders. So now that team has a, a board on Asana as it happens, but it doesn't have to be on Asana. It could be uh, on a whiteboard if you're in an office environment. Um, have all your work on there. It's ordered in terms of priority. Once a week, all the stakeholders get gather together and they agree the order things should be done in. And then they leave the team alone for a week <laughs> till they come back with the next priority request. And that's kind of a contract that we've agreed between that team and the other stakeholders. So um, that's just an, an example where you can definitely get your team bought into something like that because a lot of teams would recognize the challenges that that sort of scattergun approach to prioritization could cause and the impact it might have on people. So um, yeah, and it's worked really well so far. They continue to test, learn and iterate, of course, and we're changing the process very regularly, um, but you can get some good benefits in a team that you wouldn't traditionally think of as being an agile evangelism hotspot. And what, uh, Mike, what this conversation is uh, telling us uh, is that being Agile is a better outcome than doing Agile. It, it, it's there's quite a distinction between the two. Yes, I definitely agree. And and you know that people talk sometimes about sort of big big A Agile and lowercase A Agile. Um, and there are lots of aspects um, too. I think that the things that tie it together for me is what I said at the start around continuous improvement and and the concept of trying to. Uh, trying to get your work out in uh, as quick as possible to get real feedback on it as part of that iteration and improvement process. So um, th those are the sort of commonalities w within that. I mean, to, to Tanya's point earlier, there's so many different flavors uh, and applying any of those uh, processes that you might read about on the internet um, uh, very strictly to any team and never changing that process would be completely counter agile. Um, that's absolutely not what it's about. It's about figuring out something that works for your team and making sure you're embedding that continuous improvement into your processes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm told that we've had lots of questions uh, from you uh, already. I can see there's a fairly big number on my chat counter up on the top of my screen. So thank you so much for those of you who have asked questions. If you're still mulling over a question in your mind, it's still rattling around in there and formulating, that's okay. Uh, you've got plenty of time yet to submit your question or your observation. We'll start uh, addressing some of those in about uh, 20 minutes or so from now. So we're going to develop again the uh, thought that mindset and behaviour is at uh, the heart of a more agile approach, the importance of how people work together. And we're going to explore how technology can uh, enable that. And um, Francesca, let's start with you. You had an important point earlier uh, that I'd like you to build on now, which is that uh, the importance of respecting the whole strategy whilst also having mm. that flexibility to be agile underneath it. How agility effectively, uh, what I took from that is that you have to make sure that being agile doesn't conflict with the purpose of the organisation. Yeah. Exactly, I think, um, and that's that's a topic that I like how how those two things are intertwined, 
right, to make a company more agile. It's, it's culture and then technology is enabling that culture change or shift to happen. Um, I think what it's key, and that we've been, we've been mentioning here uh, several times, but I think what it's key for a company to uh, become more agile, um, not, not, not the big A agile, but the, but the lowercase A agile. So be more adaptable, more faster in your decisions. It's uh, empowerment, transparency, and collaboration. And I think then the technology is just the enabler. So you need to find flexible tools that are allowing you to do that, are allowing you to be transparent, to collaborate, and to empower the users, meaning that you, you let them do what they know best and, and, and they will perform. Um, I want to bring some, some survey of report that we did in Asana this last year to kind of assess how the pandemic and the world work has been changing or shifting, how we're experiencing the work. Um, and uh, we've obviously come in a, in a realization that distributed work is still very challenging. Uh, and it's kind of uh, worse than some of the topics or problems that we already had in the past. We've run this to, uh, through 13,000 employees, knowledge workers around the world, and we are seeing that 60% of the time, still, it was the, it was the case before, but 60% of the time is used for non-creative work. And that is admin stuff, looking things in your inbox, sending communications, looking for content. We have a lot of uh, increase in duplication of work. So now the teams are spread and you find yourself doing the same stuff that someone else is doing on the other side of the phone. Um, we are essentially um, growing by uh, 42% as well, unnecessary meetings. Uh, things that you could solve on the go by going to have a coffee in the office. Now you need to schedule meetings. So you find yourself scheduling 30 minutes instead of five minutes. So there's a lot of hours being lost in there. And, and that results in an astonishing number of seven out of 10 employees experienced by now last year, which is very worrisome. So obviously we need to do something. And, and here's where I want to bring that, that those, those values if you want or traits of the culture that we need to bring in order to fix some of, or improve some of those experiences, which is again, um, clarity, uh, empowerment of the user and collaboration. At Asana, we have three values, which are totally aligned with those. Uh, value of co-creation for collaboration, the uh, value of clarity for transparency, if you want, and the mission mission or purpose that Declan has been mentioning several times. And it's about the empowerment, letting the people know what their work is doing to achieve the, the, the better the better or the bigger goal. So in terms of co-creation, I think it's the collaboration, things happen uh, when team efforts are, are, are there, great achievements are, are, um, are, are uh, is, is a result of it. So um, let's say, Taking technologies that are going to empower people to do that, breaking silos, have cross-pollination between teams uh, is what we need to adopt. And a great example of this is something like Slack, because Slack is giving us the experience that we have in social lives in our, in our work experience. It gives us or it empowers us to go and have a chat with someone that is maybe two levels up in the organization in the org chart, or go and have a chat with someone else in another uh, team that we will be talking. Uh, with if we were uh, if we're using other technology, mail email feels more um, more formal. So that is already a, a good example of technology uh, that is flexible, easy to use, and that allows you to break those silos and and, and collaborate. Uh, the clarity I think is once you have that cross pollination happening, it's about understanding. And I was making that point earlier, understanding who is doing what by when, and that is what we understand in the technology piece as the work management. Right? And by having that, you are going to avoid the duplication. We've seen that that is happening uh, nowadays with this, with this pandemic and the remote work. But it also is going to make happen something that is, that is magical, that everyone is going to the same direction. Everyone, everyone knows uh, their, their um, addition to the work that is happening. And finally, to kind of nail down this is the mission, the clarity around how that work is connected to the, to the mission and the goals of the company. And that is gaining purpose in the work that is happening, gaining engagement of your employees to the company, and that engagement is avoiding most of the times or minimizing burnout because you understand what you're doing. You don't have that, that feeling of, I don't know if, if it's creating any value, whatever I'm doing here. But by, by having that transparency, I think is what's making uh, 
shifting the mindset of individuals again, and uh, with time shifting the, 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 the mindset and the culture of the company. So I think that uh, those are great examples of technology that uh, would empower and, and encourage people to behave in this way. Thank you. Uh, Tony, you were nodding at, at various points there. Your, your thoughts on that? Oh, sorry, Tony, you're still on mute. If I can, uh, this is one of the great advances in technology, <laughs> but I don't think have improved the working world. <laughs> uh, do carry on. I, I totally agree with every, everything Francesca was saying. And, um, and I guess for, for me, it's about meeting people where they are. I mean, I think technology can be such a beautiful enabler for, for people. What I think we sometimes miss is um, people are doing that in their day-to-day -day lives all of the time. They, and, it, and it feels very natural to us. You know, we, uh, for example, people um, use in personal lives, we use things like uh, Twitter or Pinterest or online shopping to just make our lives easier and to connect with people. You know, equally, we can use things like data visualization tools like Tableau to make our work life easier. Um, I think, you know, if I think about uh, TikTok or Instagram, you know, we're, we're connecting in our personal lives to people who are like minded to us and we're sharing and aggregating things together. Uh, you know, whether that's, you know, new hairstyles or uh, you know, uh, changing your bedroom furniture or whatever it happens to be. We can equally use tools like Degreed or Hive Learning to aggregate um, work activities and to, and to connect people and, and to find innovations that you never thought possible, because that, that's what a lot of these tools do. They just spark ideas and thinking that, that wasn't there before by connecting with people in, in, in meaningful ways that, that are engaging to, to you on a personal level. I think quite often, actually, organisations think that these um, human connections don't spark, don't, or they don't realise that human connection of that nature can lead to commercial value because you, you don't know what it's going to lead to. So I think if we can make technology more easy for our people to engage with, so it just feels natural rather than another implementation, another system I have to learn, I think that's the way that we'll really be able to um, to unlock the power of these technologies that are coming. I mean, I think the pandemic's really shown how that, that happens. You know, Teams for our, for our organization is the, is the platform we use. And it's just, it's very easily accepted now and it's really evolved. And, and, and as it changes, um, as it does, you know, they're evolving these things faster now than we ever thought they, they would. And we're all just accepting these changes and we're learning from each other as people point out the new technology, the new gallery view, the new, you know, the new funky backgrounds you can have or whatever it happens to be. So it's engaging and it's fun and it's human. Um, I think sometimes we forget that um, you know, agile is a human to human activity as well. Um, but but it, but it's about making it more like your your, your day lives, your, you know, your daily lives rather than work and and. Uh, work and, and home, which you know, we all know from the pandemic that it's more about the blend of that really and how, how do we find the, the beauty in that blend. And the fact that we use it so much in our everyday lives shows that we have an inherent appetite. Absolutely. Uh, for this, so long as we know, uh, going back to your earlier point, so long as we know it's relevant and useful and adds value. Well, and, and it's not even just that, that we have the appetite for it, we have the skill. I think we, we quite often think that the skill is something that needs to be learned. But with the best technologies out there, as Francesca and Michael were talking about earlier, you know, they are incredibly user friendly. You know, they're, they're, they're built to be easy to use and easily accessible. So uh, we don't have to be scared of these things. Uh, Mike, the lesson I'm getting from this uh, uh, part of the conversation is that the best technology, the most useful technology is stuff you could just pick up and use, that you're not having to spend all your time uh, reading uh, reading the manual. So it's not necessarily a, a quest for the perfect solution, but a quest for the most useful solution. Absolutely. And I want to second what Tanya was saying as well around uh, you know, if you think about, there's, there's been a bit of a technological awakening over the last year. The consumerization of technology has just accelerated so much. You know, my my grandmother in, in her care home is, is is on Zoom meetings three times a week. Um, if someone had told me that a year ago, I'd have uh, thought they were crazy. Um, so, so you know, it genuinely, the, the, the level of technology transformation that's been driven by the pandemic and the response that we've had to put in place for that has um, 
has had a, at least one positive um, side benefit in amongst all the, uh, the obviously the, the massive issues that it's caused. Um, so, so you're totally right. It's about, you know, technology isn't like it used to be. It used to be you had to read a 300 page manual before you, you sort of got the keys to the, uh, to the car, as it were. Um, people don't do that anymore. And, and, and software is developed in a way now that means the user's put first and it's much easier to use. Um, I want to just reiterate as well that uh, it, it really does need, to, as Francesc said, you know, it's a supporting role, a technology. So don't let technology get in the way. There'll be a there'll be a way of doing it, which means it's not a barrier. It's a supporting um, uh, supporting part of the puzzle. Um, and there's kind of three ways uh, I'd try to summarize how technology can help with this. So one is around data driven decision making. So in a world where we don't have data at our fingertips, uh, it's very difficult to be agile. How do you continuously improve if you don't know uh, the results of what you did the week before or the month before? Um, not really possible. Um, automating manual tasks. So to Francesca's point again, if your team's spending 70% of their week uh, manually handling spreadsheets and, and that's what's powering your business, um, are they going to have the time to be able to think to get their heads out of the the trees if you like and start to think about how they can improve probably not and then the third area is around transparency that i mentioned a bit about earlier so uh, you know if you've got teams at the moment that that um other stakeholders aren't sure what they're doing there's questions being raised about well what are they busy doing i never get my stuff done you know these sorts of problems are quite common uh, simply getting all of your work into one place into a, a simple tool uh, which the whole company can have access to and to really open those doors to, to make that team an open book, that in itself can have a massive advantage in terms of how you manage those stakeholders and also the happiness of the team as a result. Uh, and Tanya, I know you also uh, believe that uh, the use of data to inform better decision making is an important aspect of this. Uh, absolutely. I think... Um... The use of data can really help us think through um, how, how we make better decisions based on facts rather than fiction half the time. I mean, I think a lot of the time that it's back to that transparency point that both Mike and Francesca have talked about a lot, which, which incidentally I think is quite scary for a lot of people. Um, transparency means openness. It means, um, you know, be, opening the kimono as one of my, one of my clients once puts it. Um, and actually sharing and uh, where you're at, what you're doing, what you've looked at, what you haven't looked at. And it requires you to, to lean into those conversations, you know, with, to, 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 to use a, an overused phrase probably, but vulnerability. Um, and I think that's quite, that's a big, that's a big um, fear for a lot of people to move down that agile route. But, but from what I've seen, you know, the experiences I've seen of people doing this, they love it. It's actually fun. It actually provides them with, you know, to, to the data point, it provides you with a lot more um, clarity on what on the decisions that you're making. Um, but also data is, is not an exact science either. It's about, it's just another um, insight into the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so it's about, you know, being able to be mindful about how you're bringing in different types of data as well. It's not just about, the data that you gather from um, you know, spreadsheets is also about the data that you gather from uh, qualitative activities and um, you know, asking people what they generally, you know, what they believe and what they think. Uh, but it's being open about what all those things are and how you're using that data to make better decisions. But um, I think that is, a, that is definitely a journey. The transparency point is absolutely critical to making agile work, but also one of the biggest sort of mindset shifts for people to make as well. Um, but I think the more people experience it, the more they see how, how much more meaningful and how much more fun, to, to Mike's point, actually work can be. And you've, we've already mentioned at various points in passing the importance of skills, the importance of uh, training. And Tony, you said uh, that it wasn't just the appetite that we had for technology. We actually have uh, skills as well uh, to do that. But you made an important point that I did promise we'd come back to it. Uh, that uh, the timing of the training is important, that you shouldn't really train people for new approaches and new departures before you're ready for those to happen. Uh, it's certainly in, in, in our experience and in, in my personal experience, that, that's definitely the case. I think um, where, where it works best is when you train people almost in the flow of work. So ideally, and we're, we're definitely trying to move to, to, to this space, is where you're giving people 
training and development interventions at the point of need. Now, with, with Agile, I think what, what we're trying to do at Legal in general is train people and then point them at problems that the organisation is trying to solve so that you're immediately uh, getting them to use those skills in a pragmatic and practical way that shows, uh, shows a shift in, 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 in their work. I think when you, when you just train people as a concept, Oh, Tanya, sorry, you appear to have gone back on to... Uh, oh, sorry, I just yeah. out there. I'm not quite sure what the, what the tech <laughs> was doing there. We use Teams, so I'm not so used to Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> That's my well, we've upgraded you today. You're on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've totally lost my train of thought, but I think for me there is the... Um, Oh, ask me the question again, Declan. <laughs> uh, we, were, we, were, we were talking about the importance of uh, training people uh, in the uh, flow of work. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I do think we need to, to point people at the, at the problems that the organisation is trying to solve, because otherwise you, you, you do, you, you do, have, you do uh, face into the risk of training people and getting them excited about a different way of working that they then go back to their day job and isn't really the reality, you know, and, and I've definitely, in, 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 you know, in my sort of 20 years uh, career um, found actually, you know, you do run the risk of training people and actually losing them to other organisations because you've got them excited about something that doesn't, doesn't, uh, you know, pertain to their reality. But actually also you'll train people and you just have to train them again when they start needing to use this type of, um, this type of process but I suppose it's also back to your point about the being versus doing now um, there, there's a being and there's a mindset stuff that you can really help people think through and that connects to growth mindset it connects to innovation it connects to design thinking it's not just about agile uh, the mindset is about being more um, being more open being more transparent being more vulnerable all of these connect to, to agility but then the process is a different part of the training, isn't it? If you really want someone to run sprints, to run stand-ups, to, to, to um, look at their work in a very different way and mould it to a, an agile methodology, then that's, that's quite a, a detailed um, activity. So I think, again, it's about thinking about what you're try, training people on and, and why you're giving them that training and that experience. Thank you. Uh, and Mike... Uh just before we get to the uh, question from our uh, audience and thank you for sending in your questions uh, just on the sort of the the, the the point that we're drawing from uh, the discussion is that importance of having clear simple steps along the way rather than trying to have a great overarching master plan before you even take a single step yeah thank you Declan. I, I just want to absolutely second what tanya is saying about um you know, training and and uh, the, the the fact that you need to think very carefully about um, you know, how much of that would be wasted if you do it way in advance of any change. So you know, a stat I read the other day was that people on average forget more than seventy percent of what they they're taught in training one day later. Um, so if you if you've got a big master plan and you send people through a load of training and then you get to make that change a month later. It's a uh, it's a waste of time. So but did you so, say they forget it one day later? Yeah, one day later, seventy percent of what's taught. I mean, obviously, massive variables within that, depending on how the how the content's presented and how that uh, that training's provided. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's an interesting stat. At least it gets the brain worrying, doesn't it? Um, but but the, uh, this kind of further reinforces forces your point, which is you know how do you go about. So taking those small steps. So in, in your team, you know, is the first thing that you do just figure out a way that you can embed continuous improvement. Then once you've once you've done that for a few weeks or even a couple of months, do you start to think about uh, how do I get all of our work visualized in one place so it's transparent with our stakeholders? Step three might be how do we get our stakeholders prioritizing that work in a way that means that the team's not not holding that burden of what they should be working on next and being escalated and all sorts of things. Um, so the, there's a you know there's a there's a, a logical way you can start to look at this and break it down into small steps. And of course that means you can do that training iteratively, uh, do it in the flow of the work. To Tanya's point, in a way that um, people don't get swamped and they and they don't just glaze over at the thought of uh, such a massive transformation being needed and it's more about embedding that culture of continuous improvement and getting there slowly um, but surely thank you uh, we have a uh, question from daniel o'connor hello daniel uh, asking about uh, training i'm going to ask the question whichever of you uh, think you've got uh, a good answer for just jump right in uh, 
uh, with your thoughts on this. Uh, his question is this, a lot of companies want to become agile or trying source training. What advice would you give regarding the different agile frameworks and training approaches and who in the team should receive such training? So advice on uh, different uh, agile frameworks and training approaches and who should get it? Who'd like to take that? I'm happy to have a stab first. Um, so I, um, yeah, so uh, I think you know, the, the question, sorry, I forgot who was asked the question, but the, the um, yeah. th sorry, Daniel. So uh, great question and taking the two things in turn. So first of all, uh, the frameworks, um, yeah, and there are loads. Uh, there's, there's some more famous than others. Probably people have heard of Scrum and Kanban and uh, and various others. I, I, you know, I think you've got to look at this uh, depending on the team and what you're trying to achieve out of this. So, and what problems you're trying to address. And there is, you know, I, I wouldn't get hung up too much again on the precise framework because, uh, to the points we were making earlier. Uh, applying one framework rigidly and then that being it for life is just not going to work and it's not an agile way of doing things. Um, so I've seen, you know, as an ex but just to give you some examples, um, our executive team uh, at Avado runs Scrum actually. So we run weekly sprints with daily standups and sprint retrospectives every Friday, sprint backlog prioritization. These things will either mean something to you or they won't because it's a it's a whole load of um, agile terminology being spewed out there. Um, uh, but then our compliance, as a term, which, yes, yeah, it, it does absolutely. And uh, whereas we use Kanban in our compliance team, um, and we've actually molded a sort of variation of Kanban within our uh, technical development team uh, at Vardo. So um, so yeah, it's I guess. Having a chat through with somebody who's been there and done it um, is a good way of getting some feedback on that. Um, and forgive me, I've forgotten Daniel's second question, Declan. Uh, it was who in the team should get such training? Really good question. And actually, we just we commissioned some um, research recently about various companies' views on this. And it's quite interesting um, what a lot of business decisions make, decision makers think about this. I'm happy to give my opinion, which um, is that uh, everybody needs to be taken on this journey. So uh, if that involves formal training, then, then everyone should get the formal training. It doesn't mean that everyone should have the same, exactly the same training. And I think opinions differ on whether or not it's best to sort of go around all your team managers first and get, get that sort of basic level of understanding and buy-in to what you're trying to achieve um, at a sort of more senior level and then take it to the, the teams themselves. Um, what I think is important is that those team leaders or managers get the training with their teams. So they're, they're doing that journey together rather than it being a, a sort of separate exercise. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think everybody, and by the way, I'd include senior stakeholders in this. So if you don't have, because I guess the point that hasn't come out so, so much so far that I wanted to make was around culture. So if you have a fear of failure, uh, that will generate a lack of agil agility in your company. So if, 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 a, if, if a team is thinking, well, if we go live with this thing before we've tested every possible um, bug and fe or feature to make sure it works inside and out with all the edge cases, if that's the culture you've got, then that will drive a behavior where they want an extended testing period with every, every stakeholder possible involved for weeks or months on end. Uh, and that's what generates some of that inertia. Whereas if you think about ways of incentivizing positive failure, and by failure, I don't mean um, it, it wouldn't be seen as a failure in this, in this case is my point, I guess, you know, getting real user feedback early how do, how do we get our stakeholders feeding back on something we're actually delivering, not a concept or a, a design document or anything like that, but actually something that we've produced? Um, how do we get that feedback as early as possible? Um, if we're incentivizing those sorts of activities and actually rewarding the uh, innovation that comes alongside that sort of uh, behavior, then that means uh, you'll have the culture where something like this can thrive. So if you don't have your senior stakeholders, your executives, your boards, et cetera, um, signed up to this way of thinking, uh, then you'll face, uh, face an uphill struggle in terms of adoption of Agile at your company. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure Daniel will have appreciated the uh, depth of the uh, answer. Uh, the next question, I think, Francesca, I, be I, the I, best. Be okay, I, think. I just added added on to that a bit of yeah, a different, yeah, yeah. similar but different um, uh, experience. I guess is totally agree with with so much of what Mike said there. I think one practically one of the things we've been trying to do, and what I would, um, you know, and um, recommend from my experience anyone else does is actually be agile with the way you decide what agile training to adopt so 
one of the things we did in our organization was do a lot of insight gathering about what the problem was we were trying to solve because it's very easy for execs or leaders to say you know we've got a we, we want to implement agile but they don't necessarily know why and they don't necessarily know what the outcomes are that, that they, they want to achieve uh, so I think doing lots of insight work up front to really understand the problem you're trying to solve and figure out what the current lived experience of your people is is, is, is critical um, we, where we have landed is we now have a, a um, it's a digital framework actually because we see digital data and agile being uh, not not mutually exclusive of, of each other, which I think has come come through from this conversation anyway. Um, and actually, we're thinking about it in in three levels: so um, core, um, intermediate, and deep. So core is what does everyone need to know? And again, to Mike's point, um, there's different things that everybody needs to know, but there's a there's a core element that leaders and line managers and our people all need to be aware of in terms of how do you engage with agile and digital and data mindsets. There's intermediate, which is people who really need to understand. Um, they need to understand it, but they also need to understand how to use it in a more in-depth way. Uh, so core is about more about mindset, actually, and the being, then, then you're getting more into the doing as in, in intermediate. And then the deep is more about, I, I need to learn Scrum or Kanban or Python or whatever it is. But actually what we found from our experience is people at the beginning of the pandemic were asking for, we need everyone to, to, you know, we need people who are uh, not fully engaged right now to be learning, using using their time to learn. Right, let's throw them at Python. That, that in my view, is totally the wrong answer because, again, to the points we made earlier, you'll just throw training at someone who doesn't use it um, and then it, it's really, it's, it's not meaningful for them or the organisation. So I think framing it, using an agile way of thinking about uh, what's what's the decision you need to make about what's right for your organization is really important. Okay, thank you very much. We have uh, uh, lots of other questions as well. If you've submitted a question and you're thinking, oh, crikey, look at the time, they'll never get to my question. Don't worry, we are going to capture all the questions. We're going to take them away. And those that uh, need an answer afterwards will get one uh, from uh, some of the panelists uh, once they've had time to consider uh, what the best answer might be. This is from Jane King. And Francesca, I think this might be a question that you can address. What do you think is the best way to support employees who are afraid of how to manage working in an agile way when they are resistant to wanting to embrace agile working? So what's the best way to support employees uh, who are afraid uh, and experience resistance towards agile working? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think the, the the answer to that is related to any change that may happen in the company, right? It's it's all about change management. Um, and I think there's there's three points that are important there. Um, how you communicate why the change is happening, how you're um, supporting the people to do that change or training them, and then the, the ongoing as well uh, of that support. I think these three points are very important. So first of all, communication. And as Mike said, um, the, that communication needs to come from a, from a perspective of the why. So from the leadership team, why we're doing this shit. Uh, that already, already gives a, a different, different perspective to that person that maybe is afraid or doesn't want to do the change. Then it's all about the support of the introduction to that new change. Um, it's about the training. How are we doing the training? What are we putting in that training? But definitely that support on the first phases of that change. Um, I think one, one important point that I, I, would, I would raise for any change management that I don't think either Tanya or Mike have uh, mentioned before is uh, the concept of champions or, or, or key users. Uh, those peers of yours, of that person that might be afraid of the change that are going to be the champion to pull forward the rest of the team. And you would find these profiles, these personas in every single team for them to, together with the manager maybe, pull the team forward on that change and keep on iterating on why we're doing this, uh, know that you're supported, know that we're doing the change together, as Mark said. Um, and, and it's all about that, that, uh, that process. Obviously then, it's not about the training and the onboarding, the first step, it's about how you're iterating on, on top of whatever they've learned already. So talking about the successes that other teams have done and that is already again putting more more seeds in that in that shift of the mindset 
And uh, a related question, Mike, if I can get a brief answer uh, to you on this one from Gemma Patterson. Uh, how, uh, excuse me, from Lydia in Cheva, how do you get the buy-in from teams in the organisation that cannot be agile? Mike, you talked earlier that uh, being agile may not work everywhere. Yeah, it's a great question, Lydia, wasn't it? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, and by the way, you know, we've, we've, we faced that challenge um, when we actually rolled out a, a more agile approach in our compliance team at Avado. So, um, you know, uh, there's a think about the the implications of what we did there some people were used to sort of phoning up the team or members of the team that they knew if they had something particularly urgent to get done and and it got done you know at the expense potentially of other priorities but you know it that was something that they didn't want to lose um and i think it's it's back to buying into buying them into the bigger picture so what why why are you trying to make this change and and how does it benefit them so you know, it's explaining the context for the broader company, the context for that particular team, um, the consequences maybe of, of, of the, the things that hadn't gone so well previously, uh, so that, and also any opportunities that you can take advantage of. So it's not just about problems, it's also about looking for opportunities you could take advantage of if you implement something like this. So uh, yeah, so that's what I'd focus on is uh, trying to look at it from their perspective and explain, you know, why we're going on this journey and why it's important to the company. Okay, thank you very much. We also have great questions from Kaisha, from uh, Gemma, from Connie, and from many, many others as well. Uh, thank you so much for submitting your question. I'm afraid we no longer have the time in this forum to consider the answers, but we are capturing all the questions. We're going to take them all away, and we're going to ask our distinguished panellists to uh, send some answers to you as part of the uh, feedback process that uh, follows this event. So thank you so much for all of your questions, for your participation. Uh, I know you'll join me in thanking our superb panelists, Tanya Bacci, Mike Fennan, and Frances Artigas. Thank you very much to the three of you. We hope this Unlocking Agility webinar series has helped shed some light on how agility doesn't just apply to tech or product teams, but can be effective for the whole organization. We hope you find it thought provoking and that it will spark some discussion within your organization. Those of you who are Avado clients, please do get in touch with your Avado contact. They will uh, help you through the next steps towards building capacity for organizational agility. If you're not an Avado client and you'd like to have a discussion with someone on the team uh, about any of the themes that were covered in today's discussion or indeed anything else that may occur to you, then don't hesitate to get in touch. The contact details that you need are now on your screen. But that brings our time together and our discussion today to a close. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for giving us your time, your attention, for your questions and for your interest. I'm Declan Curry. Thank you for your company.